Fish. This is Stony Sunday episode 166 and as you might have noticed I've decided to switch it up a little bit. The backdrop is alive and well. Please don't worry. I do still have the classic, my favorite backdrop, this tie-dye teal and kind of maroon colored but tacking it up to the wall every single week is just kind of ruining this tapestry and I really like the feel of a different background each week switching it up a little bit showing you a little bit more of my life my home and what's going on so I hope you guys kind of like this switch to something a little bit different what will stay the same with Stony Sunday is it's a new show every single week question and answer as always the show is sponsored by Bovida who provides the humidity control packs that I send out in every single goodie bag if I use your question on the show you gave me a way to contact you either on stonysunday.com or on Twitter then I send you a goodie bag that has the Bovida and also some humble hemp wick like I am smoking with I have six questions this week to answer and I hope you guys are smoking along with me Cheers Thank you all, by the way, for joining me during the live six special last week. I just wasn't up to recording and editing and that whole thing. And doing a live half hour show with all of you was really, really fun. Yeah, I had a really good time. So thank you guys for watching that. The first question this week comes from Michelle. She asked on StonySunday.com. Thank you for submitting a question. She is in college and she's in class and hearing a lot of misinformation when it comes to cannabis. A lot of things are coming up either from her teacher and the textbooks where cannabis is used as a negative, it's bulked in with other drugs when they're talking about rehabilitation and general health and drug use, and it's frustrating for her as a cannabis user, cannabis patient in California, um, to be seeing so much negative stigma and attention with cannabis. So Michelle was wondering how can she counter that misinformation in class and also with her friends. And while this is a really common question to get, like how do you counter misinformation, I picked Michelle's one in particular because in class is very tricky. You can't just take on the education system and all of the textbooks and misinformation that's out there dead on. Like you can't just confront it and be like, hey, I'd like you to change all of your thousands of textbooks and actually say the truth now. Unfortunately, I don't think it would be that easy and I don't think it's going to be that black and white. So I can totally understand the frustration of hearing bullshit in class and not knowing what to do. Um, if you are on financial aid, if you have like FAFSA or whatever other scholarships are going on, you are pretty much like you owe the government money. You are loaned money from the government. So breaking federal law is a huge risk on your end. And then going around talking about it can just draw a lot of attention to whatever cannabis use you do already. It's something that I personally was very uncomfortable with the just the risk of being a cannabis user in a government funded area such as a school. I was just really uncomfortable with all of it and I it was one of the reasons why I didn't pursue college more seriously because I didn't feel comfortable and welcome there and like I really was recognized as a I don't know a decent student there was so much bullshit going on um I don't think everyone should drop out of college just because they don't accept pot smokers out and about that's really not what I'm saying but you do have to understand the investment into your education and if you maybe want to just take your time with your education and get your degree and not put yourself at risk right away. There are other ways to be involved in still changing policy. Off campus, you can join groups like Normal. Students for Sensible Drug Policy actually would be perfect for you. Um, Students for Sensible Drug Policy has on campus and off campus chapters. So you don't even have to be involved like through your school, but you are of course more than welcome to. There's always value in just starting a conversation about cannabis and just saying like, hey, I wonder where they got those facts or wow, this textbook's obviously outdated. Making comments like that, I think, can generally stimulate, you know, thought about cannabis without just pinpointing you as a daily cannabis user. But when it comes to talking with your friends and their negative stigmas about cannabis, don't be as tolerant. Don't be as patient. There's no reason why a young adult needs to judge or shame another young adult or even full adult, old person, whatever age you are. There's no reason another human needs to shame a human 
for choosing cannabis and allowing that in a friendship is going to hurt you in the long run. Um, it probably hurts you daily anyway. So if this is not a conversation that you can have with that friend, then just pursue other friends and how you spend your time is your choice. So make it a decision that you're proud of and that you like. Um, I think my mom answered it like perfectly when she did a stony Sunday and someone asked her, how do you deal with people judging you for allowing coral to smoke weed? And she just said, well, I don't have judgmental friends, so it's not a problem. And I was just like, my God, my mom is so badass. I was so proud of her. Um, it was awesome. Thank you, Michelle, for submitting this question. The next question I did get from Twitter with Chase Lassane. I'm going to take a bong hit. And with this change of background, by the way, you might, like, see people walking through. You could see cats. Anything could happen here in Oakland. You just never know. People have asked, like, why don't I let my boyfriend host a Stony Sunday show? And I find that ridiculous. Like, there's nothing I don't really, like, let him do that would be... I don't know. I just don't... I don't, like, keep him from hosting Stony Sunday. That doesn't really make a lot of sense to me. But it is, as I've mentioned in the past, just my show. And the, like, point of it isn't just to talk about who I'm dating or to show off, like, that whole part of my life. But it's definitely relevant as I'm vlogging and sharing a lot of parts of my life. You guys know about my boyfriend and who I am dating, so I don't keep him from you guys. He has his own stuff going on. He even has his own YouTube videos, which I don't know if I'm supposed to tell you guys, but it's true. Um, but yeah, I don't keep him from you guys, so like, I'm not that evil. That was not Chase Lestane's question. It was just a totally off topic one. But the screen name Chase Lusane asked a question with hashtag Ask Stony Sunday. And his question is actually if I had any tips for daily smokers that just had teeth removed. He had his wisdom teeth removed. And it's recommended that you don't smoke weed. A lot of times doctors will say don't smoke weed. And you don't know whether you should believe them or not. Because is it really for your health or is it just because they are an outdated kind of old fashioned doctor that's saying don't smoke weed. When it comes to getting your teeth removed and anything oral surgery wise, listen to the doctor. Def listen to your dentist in this case. Um, you don't want to have an overly dry mouth and you don't want to have a lot of suction. So they definitely don't want you to be like inhaling on a pipe, inhaling on a bong would be a big no, no. Um, when I'm just like under the weather, I do still hit a dab or take a dab, hit a bong, that whole thing. But when it comes to oral surgery, definitely be more hesitant. Be very, very careful. Look into tinctures so that you can just put some, put a little cannabis, cannabinoids, um, into your drink, whatever you may be drinking. <laughs> Happy Stony Sunday, you guys. Um, also, if you just had your teeth removed, you're probably on prescribed narcotics. And having heavy narcotics and then getting super, super high is not something I would really, like, recommend at all. So just take it easy for a couple of days. I think it's like a week or two that they have you healing up. And just really go for those tinctures if you can. When it comes to smoking again, anything where you are just not inhaling a bunch and, like, having the suction that's going to... It's going to suck off scabs in your mouth if you have teeth removed. Uh, and then making sure you keep your mouth hydrated after you smoke. Like you want to have a lot of water nearby. And that's a general tip. Even if you don't have teeth removed, the things that I've heard from dentists in general are that they don't like smoking cannabis or they don't like patients smoking cannabis because it dries out their mouths and that can lead to cavities and poor dental health. So be sure you keep that mouth nice and hydrated. And it's better for your body, too, of course. I think I said that when I was sick. I was, like, delirious on water, and I was just like, I love water. Whenever I get sick or, like, I'm camping and I just, like, down a bunch of water, I feel like I have this ecstasy moment with water where I'm just like, it's perfect. It's the only thing I should ever drink. It makes you feel so good. And then I go back to Pepsi as soon as I'm, like, back in real life or feeling better. It's terrible. I don't know. I need to like meditate on that for a while I think. But the next question is from Emerald Moon. And Emerald 
Uh, so I really like that name, by the way. It's like my mom's favorite stone, so I always pay attention to emeralds. But Emerald Moon said that she read when Colorado first rec legalized recreational cannabis sales, they made a million dollars the first day, let alone five million dollars the first week of legal sales. Uh, Emerald was wondering if they are paying federal tax on these millions of dollars that shops are raking in. And if they're not paying federal taxes, do I think the federal government is going to read the same headlines we're reading about those millions of dollars and kind of want in? What's going on? It's a really good question that you've brought up. Um, the short answer is that Colorado passed a state tax with cannabis for recreational use. So if you are an adult of over 21 years of age, you will pay, it's above 20%, it's like 23% or something, um, tax for recreational cannabis, for the right to use it, basically, for the freedom to go in and have a legal cannabis shop, there is a very, very high tax. It makes it one of the highest taxed items in Colorado. In addition to that tax, which is a state tax, Colorado gets that money, other communities, other cities and counties have also passed smaller local taxes. So Denver has one making it like the highest in the, I think the state, Denver has one of the highest prices in the area just based on taxes, or highest percent of tax total, excuse me, price could still change. Um, but those taxes again go to the state, not the federal government. When it comes to paying tax to the federal government, there's a huge catch-22. If you announce and make deductions for all of the money you have made in the way you run your business as a cannabis dispensary to the federal government, you are also handing them all of the evidence that you've broken federal law. All of the evidence. There is no federal protection, banking, criminally, whatever it is for cannabis. We don't have that safety yet. So that is why um, the big fight to change 280E has come up. Steve D'Angelo of Harborside Health Center, he's the first person that comes to mind running the 280E reform project. I'm sure there are many other people involved, but he's always the one that comes to mind when it comes to like these grassroots campaigns that are incredibly important and need attention. He's on the ball with that stuff. The 280E reform project would change the tax law so that dispensary owners and affiliated businesses can really deduct their business expenses, their rent, their payroll, whatever they need to keep their stock in in a safe area. Like you have to have your little little shelves, you gotta have your boxes, your stickers, your every all of these business expenses can't be deducted currently federally. So with 280E reform that could change hopefully. But it's just this huge problem then for the dispensaries to not file federal taxes and later be called in by the government and say, why didn't you file taxes on all that money you made? It's this huge problem where if you say you made the money, you're an outlaw. And if you pretend you didn't make the money, you are breaking the law. It's frustrating. It's why 280E needs to be changed. But when it comes to state and local taxes, California, Washington, Colorado, medical and legal states, generally speaking, do make money off of medical sales. When it comes to Colorado, they're making a significant account, a significant account, excuse me, amount more in recreational taxes than medical. If you're a medical patient in Colorado, your access has remained the same and your taxes did not go up. So this tax is only for adults wanting the recreational access. I'm using the bowl from the fish bong right now, by the way. It's just so cute. I could not use it. I wish I could remember the artist's name, but I got the bowl at Puff Puff Pass in San Francisco. Pretty sure. A little bit left ground up, and then I'll get grinding up some more of this Cherry AK, which is one of my favorite strains to just smell. The terpenes of Cherry AK, they hit me just right, and they're just... It just smells so good. I think like this train wreck is one of my favorites. A really good OG Kush, but it's kind of harder to like find that. So most OG Kushes don't. But these little nuggets of the Cherry AK, super tasty. $10 a gram. So okay with that price when they look, smell, and taste like this too. 
Um, and the next question came from an anonymous person on StonySunday.com. That's one of the reasons why I do have that site uh, up and running. If you guys ever want to ask anonymous leaks, you're embarrassed, or you just don't want your name attached to a random question about cannabis, you can go and submit a question to StonySunday.com slash AskStonySunday. This person asks if I had more thoughts to give on legalization versus decriminalization. They say that when pot is legalized, the government will be in control of it and it may lead to it having cancerous properties just as a lot of things in our environment tend to, tend to these days I'd say. Everything causes cancer they say. Um, but at this point we know that cannabis cures cancer in some ways and certainly treats cancer. So this person was wondering if I'm worried if the government's going to get their hands on pot, if they're going to ruin it. And I really wanted to answer this question because it comes up often, constantly. When you speak about legalization to stoners, I say that term with a lot of love, a lot of stoners or potheads or daily tokers, they will respond that they don't want legalization because everything's fine as it is right now. They obviously can get high and maybe it should just be decriminalized so less people would be sitting in jail. These people that are saying these regurgitated facts don't know what they're talking about. Decriminalization is a fine. Decriminalization is a slap on the wrist for something you should have the legal right to do without asking permission. Decriminalization is not okay. To me, decriminalization is a civil union when I want a marriage. It's not what I want. It's not halfway. It's not an acceptable compromise. Decriminalization is still saying, I'm sorry I was smoking weed. Here's $100 with my ticket. And fuck that. We shouldn't have to say sorry. I support legalization because when pot is legalized, it will be because of the laws the people wrote and passed, not because the government changed it suddenly. The laws that we are writing will decide how you can grow it, where you can grow it, where you can buy it, how much you can buy. And if those laws are not things that you are happy with, that's something you can get involved with and change. I do not like this overarching paranoia that when something is legalized, it's no longer in our control. The world is in our control and cannabis is in our control. It's the right thing to do to legalize. And I just, I don't hear these bullshitty excuses. I hate them so much, obviously. Um, it just doesn't make any sense to me. I always try and bring up the point of strawberries. Strawberries are like, they're legalized. Strawberries are legal. You can grow strawberries in your backyard. I grew them in my elementary school. They were delicious. They were awesome. We also went at my elementary school to a strawberry like farm where they sold those strawberries. Those sold strawberries were under completely different regulations than the strawberries I grew in my backyard. That's the facts. If I want to grow something and sell it to the public, there's going to be regulations involved. For safety, for health, for just simple counting reasons, you're going to have things organized and regulated. doesn't mean it's evil. You have the choice when you go to buy strawberries to buy local, organic, sustainably grown strawberries, fair wages, whatever you are looking for. Or you can go and you can buy Walmart strawberries and you don't know where they came from, how old they are, or what was sprayed on them to make them stay red. You have the choice is what I'm saying. So when you walk around saying that you don't support legalization because you think the government will take over, you sound stupid. And I'm frustrated with it and I think everyone should just stop putting up with that in their circle of friends as well. No, no, decrim is not the answer. Decrim still comes with a fine. Just because it was decriminalized in California, it's not legal. Just because it's like legal here doesn't let Mark Emery or Eddie Lepp or any of the other prisoners out of jail. Like legal, us getting high and having access doesn't change the lives that are ruined and the families that are split up. So try not to forget about everyone else in the world when you're getting high and instead think of all of the freedom that you have and all of the things you can do with it to tell the world that you're not a bad person with that freedom. By smoking weed daily, I haven't ruined my life and that's one of the biggest things I just try and show with my channel. This complacency and like happiness with 
what we currently have without even thinking about what other people don't have still, that is kind of what is inspiring me to get to Australia. They don't have it like we do in California. People in Australia don't have home grows like we do. They don't have concentrates. I've already been told a few times I'm going to be disappointed with the scene in, in Australia and I find that ridiculous because I'm not going there looking for the best bud in the world. I know that's at home. I am going there to see what it's like for someone that's still struggling, for a country that doesn't have the laws that we do. We've had medical marijuana in California for 17 years, 18 years? My God, this year in 2014, it's going to be 18 years. That is most of my life, obviously, and it's just something that I am proud of and excited for, but I need to keep fighting for the people that don't have that yet. Someday in Australia, there will be someone that can say they've had medical marijuana access for 18 years, but it's not going to happen overnight, and I really want to get down there and just see a current state of affairs and know how I can help more. Yeah. Next question is from Tender Masochist. A fascinating name. Anyway, uh, Tender Masochist says, what was the moment that made me go from cannabis user to activist? Dun, dun, dun. Cheers, you guys. I really hope you're smoking along with me. If you are not able to, this hit is for you. I think there are two moments that come to mind, and I am not honestly sure which one was first. Um, two moments, though. But before those two moments, I do have to give a huge shout-out to Cannabis Cure UK. Him and I would be talking on Skype, and we'd be smoking together, and he was an activist. Like, he was going and speaking about cannabis publicly, and he was changing people's lives. He was getting them involved and getting them registered and, like, just getting them... I, he was doing amazing things. He still is doing amazing things. Greg is awesome. And I remember talking to him one time, and he said something and referred to me as an activist, and I was like, no, no, no. You're an activist. I'm an enthusiast. And I remember at the time being like, I'm sad that that's the truth, but it's the truth, and that's how I identify. Um, later on, two moments, I would say, changed my life, and one of which would be... When Harborside received the letter, um, it was October of 2011, I'm pretty sure. October of 2011 was when about 45 letters went out in California. And they were basically just a knock-knock, it's the federal government, we're watching you type letter. Um, I frequented Harborside twice a week easily. And... When they got that warning, it just shook me up and made me realize that what you have access to today is not permanent. As long as the federal law doesn't change, it's all just, please don't raid us. That's all it is right now. Um, it's unfortunate, and it shook me up. Um, I, like, within, I think, it was not too long after that that, Har or that Oaksterdam was raided, and I was at that raid. Um, I, you know, I heard it was going on, and I showed up to film it and to be a witness to what I found to be a dark mark on Oakland's history. Um, I had to leave that raid to go waitress, and it was definitely a very, very hard moment for me. I cried on Bart, and I was just so mad that I had to go serve fish and chips when people were being arrested for what I. I believed in. Um, it was a moment that I knew I had to. I had to go to work. I had to pay rent. Is the bottom line. I can't. Um, I couldn't reach the people that I'm reaching if I was homeless without internet. So I had to go to work to pay the bills. And leaving that raid was. It hurt a lot. It was really really hard for me. Um, so those two moments definitely made me realize that I cared in a way about cannabis that I didn't really realize uh, I cared so deeply and like I knew how it helped me and I knew how important it was and I definitely I was already involved this was not too long ago I was already running my blog I was doing my sites but those two moments just I don't know they resonated with me and they made me realize that this is my own fight this isn't something that affects other people this isn't patients versus the state of California this is like 
me. This is me versus the government. It's the dispensary I went to. It's the people that I believe in. And I don't know. It just changed the way I spoke about it, I think. And I think people definitely saw that in my videos and my posts. Um, you can't unring the bell, as they say. Who says that, by the way? Like, where did that come from? I definitely like that phrase because it's true. You can't unring the bell. But I don't know where that came from. Almost made it through this episode without much coughing. There will always be that hit that gets you, though. Packing another bowl of the Cherry AK. I think there's only one question left this week. Also from Twitter with hashtag AskStonySunday. I don't answer questions on the show from Instagram. It's too hard to find them. They're everyone. I just no Instagram. Go to StonySunday.com or Twitter hashtag AskStonySunday like Pyro Page did. And I know Pyro Page has a Sony Sunday shirt either on her way or it's like arrived to you. Thank you so much for ordering. Uh, I'm super excited about this batch of shirts. And once all of these green ones have arrived and everything, the next batch is going to be new colors. I will tell you they are darker. I don't want to tell you anything else. They're darker. Yeah. They're really cool. Um, I need to get like the proofs back and everything before I really tell you much about them but anyway thank you for ordering the green shirt pyro page if I remember right even you snagged the last one in your size so way to go super reefer it was awesome um this question is about the sea vault giveaway if you follow me on instagram you may have noticed a bunch of reposts about this sea vault and it's because I'm giving away 12 of them all year. 11 more one was already given away it will be sent in the mail tomorrow on Monday and Paige asking if I'm going to give them away all on Instagram. No. <coughs> <coughs> I will definitely be breaking up all of the giveaways across Tumblr, YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. There could even be a Vine a Pinterest, is that all of them? Mass Roots, there could be any sort of giveaway. The 12 sea vaults or 11 remaining sea vaults vary in size. They're the small and the medium. This is the small one. I love mine. I've used it for years. I have heard some feedback that the joints are becoming looser with daily use. That is something I've never experienced in my years of using the sea vault, but it's not my daily stash jar. This is something that's for the favorite nugs. I just tuck it away, the little bovita thing, and I'm all good to go. And you guys, they stay beautiful. Oh, I love that nug. Anyway, um, those giveaways will definitely be switched up, varied all around. And thank you for everyone who participated in the first Sea Vault giveaway. It was awesome. And thank you, Fresh Store and Sea Vault, for allowing me to share all of these awesome Sea Vaults. They're like one of my favorite products for smoking in general. I don't even smoke as much flour as I used to, but the Sea Vault is still completely essential to me. It's even more essential because I'm smoking less, so I need them around. Um, yeah, that was all the questions for this week's Stony Sunday. Thank you guys for watching. There will be the news nug recap after I show off all of your amazing Stony Sunday shirts. Be sure to post with the tag Stony Sunday shirt, Tumblr, Instagram, and Twitter. I will find that picture and repost it here in the video. Thank you guys so much for watching and staying high with me. Yes, there are pins available right now. $25 to reserve your favorite number. Later, a random numbered pin will be sent out at a lower price. The $25 is for like your favorite number, 1 to 420. There's already a list of the numbers that have been reserved. You have to find that on Etsy, coralreefer420.etsy.com. But the $25 includes the goodie bag with the Bovida, the Humboldt hemp wig, and then 
the really special, I'm really excited, it's going to be super glittery, but also really, really weedy, limited edition, purple and green stay high pin. So I'm going to take number 19 for sure. My boyfriend has called number 3. I know Farmer John 420 is getting number 13. Yeah, definitely go and reserve your number. Uh, thank you guys for the support. The pins are also to help fundraise for the trip to Australia and get that show on the road. Thank you guys. One more long hit before I roll those Stony Sunday shirts. Say hi. You can follow Newsnug at facebook.com slash newsnug, also twitter or instagram.com slash newsnug. It's cannabis news stories five days a week. The first story I want to bring to you is about the French Drug Safety Agency approving the medicinal use of Sativex. Sativex is not a complete answer, but having medicinal use of cannabis is definitely something I support. It's a cannabis-derived drug, Sativex itself. It doesn't have the same results of cannabis. Synthetic and derived drugs do not have the same results as the whole cannabis plant or other concentrates of the plant. Definitely different than a synthesized or derived version as Sativex is. But allowing cannabis to be used in any way definitely gets the conversation started. And I've heard in the past that France is very anti-cannabis. I was warned about my pot leaf tattoos, like don't show them or I could be searched. So just having that use, I definitely support. Something to look into. The next story is about people in Kentucky. Kentuckians, as the article said. I think that word's just funny sounding. I don't know if I'm saying it right when I say it. Um, but Kentuckians? Ken Kentuckians? Kentuckians plead with legislature to legalize medical marijuana. I love the tone of this article from Kentucky.com. It was basically saying that people are desperate for it, that they are sick, they're hurt in Kentucky, they are leaving the state, they're going to legal medical or, or recreational states like Colorado, and they're getting the help they need and they wish they could have that at home. It was definitely uh, an interesting read. Um, I have yet to visit Kentucky. It's one of those states I haven't gone to. Also, Alaska is a state I have not gone to in the third story I want to bring up. Alaska is taking efforts to legalize the recreational use of cannabis. Everyone wants in this game. It's definitely something that the future is only going to bring more of. If you are an Alaska reefer, definitely get involved. They've already submitted the signatures, but from there, there's probably going to be a measure or something to support, and you definitely want to gain publicity for that. The fourth story is about New York State loosening medical marijuana laws, which is a very confusing headline because they're not that much looser. There is medical marijuana access at this point from Mr. Kumo, but they are just, I don't even know if I'm saying his name right, um, but anyway, New York would just allow 20 hospitals to prescribe marijuana, which still isn't an accurate term because you can't prescribe something that's not federally approved at this point. Um, and the diseases that New York allows are so restrictive. It would be cancer, glaucoma, things that you really have to have already sought so much pharmaceutical drugs that they've already gotten a lot of money out of you, they being the government, insurance companies, and pharmaceutical companies. And it's pretty much cannabis is allowed as a last resort type drug, and I don't like those types of laws. Cannabis should be allowed as a preventative medicine and just healthy daily use. Um, the fifth story I want to bring up is from theatlanticcities.com, and again, you can find all of the links at facebook.com slash newsnug. That'd be the best bet for each story and its link. Um, this fifth story is, could legal marijuana help curb prescription pill abuse? And it's a hundred percent yes. This story in particular had a map just showing the density of prescription pill overdoses. 
Um, certain states are hit in particular very, very hard. And it's something that absolutely cannabis, having access to it, can help reduce the harm of these harder drugs, help reduce the need or the call of these harder drugs. I definitely um, bring that up all the time. I was raised in a family of sobriety. Everyone's very sober, various terms and reasons. Um, and yet I just am always wishing they would mention cannabis at different meetings because I think it could help so many people that are that are really addicted to prescribed drugs that are accepted in other parts of the same country. There's the idea that you can replace your pharmaceuticals that are helping you with cannabis and that is true and that's amazing and powerful and then there's the idea that the people that are hurting themselves with pharmaceuticals could also replace it with cannabis and it would still end up helping them instead of hurting them as they were it is incredible this plant is amazing i'm happy to be on the right side of this plant and thank you guys for watching i'll see you all next week if not sooner as always stay high